Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Mallory Dusenberry, and I'm the Associate Director of the Economic Security for Survivors Project here at the Institute for Women's Policy Research. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about the status of women and girls in states across the country and strategies for using data to improve the economic security and safety of survivors. I have just a few quick tech notes before we dive into the content. You can listen in today via the toll-free number provided in your registration email or listed at the top of your screen. Your phones have been muted to minimize background noise for the speakers. If you have any tech issues or questions for the presenters, please use the chat box located in the lower left corner of your screen and direct it to the chairperson. For technical support, you can also call ReadyTalk at 800-843-9166 and I'll also put that in the chat in just a moment. We will try to address the questions as they come up throughout the course of the presentation, uh, but we will also try to save some time for questions and comments at the end. We will sound out the recording and the PowerPoint to those registered following the event, and our contact information will be included at the end of the presentation, and we do encourage ongoing conversations about this. So founded in 1987, the Institute for Women's Policy Research is the leading think tank in the United States focusing on the quantitative and qualitative analysis of public policy through a gendered lens. IWPR works with policymakers, scholars, and public interest groups to design, execute, and disseminate research that illuminates economic and social policy issues affecting women and families. IWPR's five key program areas consist of employment, education, and economic change, poverty, welfare, and income security, work and family, democracy and society, which includes the status of women and girls project we'll be discussing today, and finally, health and safety, under which the economic security for survivors project is now housed. To those unfamiliar with us, the Economic Security for Survivors Project started in 2010 as a Wider Opportunities for Women project. And while we are very saddened that WOW had to close its doors, we are thrilled to have moved to a new home at IWPR earlier this summer where we can continue our work. The S Project is a national technical assistance and training project that identifies barriers that threaten survivor economic security and safety and offers solutions based on data and best uh, practices. We work with direct service providers, justice system professionals, community institutions, and policymakers to help them integrate an economic lens into their existing response to survivors of violence and abuse to best meet their needs. As I mentioned, my name is Mallory Dusenberry, and I'm the Associate Director of the S Project. I've been with the project uh, since nearly its inception at WOW, and I focus primarily on criminal justice system interventions as well as conducting trainings, exploring the intersections of economics and safety for underserved populations, and researching the cost of abuse. I'm joined today by two of my esteemed colleagues, Julie Anderson and Asha Dumontier. Julie is a research associate here at IWPR, working primarily on the status of women in the states, the status of women in the South report, and numerous other projects related to job training, work support, and breadwinner mothers. Asha is an IWPR research assistant who has contributed to the Status of Women in the South report, research on the gender wage gap, and several upcoming S product, uh, project products. So now that you know who we are, we'd love to get a sense of who is on the call with us today. Uh, if you could, please take a minute to let us know what sector you are joining us from. Okay, so it looks like we actually have a very interesting mix across sectors, and we're very excited about that. I'm curious about uh, the other category, so if you would like to include that in the chat, that would be wonderful. Um, but I'm loving that we're seeing a good mix of social service, advocate, researcher, uh, policy analysts, and government agency staff and DV staff. 
So welcome to everyone. So before I turn it over to Julie to dive into the status of women research, I wanted to spend a quick minute grounding us all in the S Project framework. For us, the motto at the core of what we do is really that economic security equals safety and that you can't have safety without economic security. There are several ways that we see economic insecurity and violence linked, all of which can intersect and compound upon one another. First, economic insecurity and poverty can keep victims trapped in an abusive relationship for longer because they lack the resources to leave and thrive on their own. Uh, they may be unable to obtain medical care, secure housing, child care and transportation, or take time off work to access the justice system. According to a 2012 survey of domestic violence shelters, 74% of victims stayed with an abuser longer because of financial reasons. And the longer that they stay, the more at risk they are of violence, the economic consequences of that violence, and economic abuse by the offender as a tool of power and control. The violence and abuse survivors experience impact their work and education, their health, their access to credit and finances, their housing, and much more. While there are a number of ways to respond to the economic needs of survivors across all sectors, it is important to be aware of the larger barriers they face stemming from the policies and economic realities where you all are based across the states. While we acknowledge that violence occurs regardless of sex, gender identity, or sexual orientation, it is also true that women are much more likely to be victims. The data on women and girls that we're going to be exploring today can serve as a valuable tool for identifying how to best support survivors and where to focus your advocacy efforts within the states. And with that, uh, who here is familiar with the status of women resources and has used them before? So it looks like uh, the majority of you have not, which is exciting because we love introducing you all to new tools and resources that will help you going forward. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julie. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to share this with you. I could talk about the status of women in the States all the time, so it's nice to have people who are both familiar and some who are just going to be getting to know about the project and information for the first time. So there's a little bit of background to the status of women in the states. IWPR has been doing the Status of Women in the States project since 1996, and we primarily use data from federal government sources. So most of the data in this webinar use American Community Survey microdata, and in places where there are other data sources, we've noted them on the slides. Most recently in 2015, we released a completely updated Status of Women in the States as both a comprehensive report and a new interactive website providing state-level data on the seven topic areas you see listed above. So employment and earnings, poverty and opportunity, work and family, violence and safety, reproductive rights, health and well-being, and political participation. All areas that, as you know, intersect with one another and intersect with violence. The project provides thousands of data points with breakdowns by state, race and ethnicity, age, and other demographic characteristics. And we also rank and grade each of the states on their performance in these areas to reveal where there's a need for progress. So the Status of Women in the States project is designed to be a tool for agents of change at both the state and national levels to use for advocacy, to guide philanthropy, and to shape policy. Today I'm going to share just a few key findings related to employment and earnings, poverty, access to work family supports like paid sick and safe leave and quality affordable childcare, and violence in the workplace. Since we're talking about economic security, I wanted to begin with just a few basic statistics about women in the labor force. In 2013, 59% of women aged 16 and older were in the labor force meaning they were either employed or were actively looking for work. An even greater share of moms with kids under the age of six were in the labor force, 67%. And although most employed women and men work full-time, 29% of women work part-time, and women are almost twice as likely as men to work part-time. It's also important to look at the broad occupations that women work in and the typical earnings for those occupations. 
Over a quarter of employed women are in professional and related occupations, generally well-paid jobs that tend to have benefits. But the second most common occupations are in service, which includes personal care aides, home health aides, cooks, and food service staff. More than one in five women work in service jobs, the occupations with the lowest earnings. It's also interesting to notice that two of the occupations which offer good middle skill jobs meaning that they require some education or training past high school but not a degree, are those with the fewest women. So those are in production, transportation, and material moving, and natural resources, construction, and maintenance. So it's, it's interesting to note that, um, as many of us know, survivors are often kept from, from working, from being in the labor force by an abuser as a tactic of control. Uh, they're also often asked to resign or are fired because of the abuse. Um, either taking place in the workplace or, um, or the effect it has on, on the workplace. Uh, and they often miss wages and promotions because of the abuse. Uh, so for survivors who are seeking independence and stability, a uh, good paying um, and often full-time job may be critical. Let's also take a closer look at differences in earnings by state. In 2013, the median annual earnings of women working full-time year-round ranged from a high of $60,000 in the District of Columbia to a low of $30,000 in four states, Arkansas, Idaho, Mississippi, and South Dakota. But we all know that the cost of living in Arkansas is not the same as D.C., so it's meaningful to look at the gender wage gap for each state. It's interesting to note here how the top and bottom states don't exactly match up. D.C. and Maryland are on both lists, meaning that women's wages are high and the wage gap is relatively small. But other states that aren't in the top five for earnings are rated highly because they have a small wage gap, so New York, Vermont, and Florida, for example. And the only state on the bottom of both lists is West Virginia, so it both has low earnings and has a high wage gap. To look at the differences in the cost of living in D.C. compared with Arkansas, I pulled up the basic economic security tables to see what it costs to support a family with one worker who receives benefits, one infant, and one school-aged child. This puts the median annual earnings in perspective. So while women in D.C. have the highest annual earnings in the country, what that family described would need $85,000 to cover basic expenses. And Arkansas is one of the lowest earning states for women but the cost of basic living expenses there is about $46,000. So in other words, women in D.C. earn 70% of what they would need, and women in Arkansas earn 64% of what they would need to support themselves, an infant, and a young school-aged child. And in addition to the best expenses, uh, survivors often face higher costs for health care than what's listed here, and additional costs related to property damage, safety planning, and even relocation. Uh, so while these numbers may seem, seem high upon the first look, they're often much higher for survivors. And I'd like to pull out one specific expense, the cost of child care. We looked at the average annual cost of full-time care for an infant in a center for each of the states and compared that with the median annual earnings for women working full-time year-round in those states. You can see the portion of the earnings taken up by child care costs and the rankings for each state. So looking at Alabama, ranked number one, the child care costs are 16.8% of Alabama women's median earnings, which is the lowest share in the country. So Alabama is one of eight states where child care costs are less than 20% of women's median annual earnings. But in D.C., Minnesota, Massachusetts, and New York, child care costs are a third or more of women's earnings. So this is another valuable way to put earnings into perspective. So looking at the graph above, we can see that the wage gap between men and women who worked full-time year-round was stuck at around 60% through the 1960s and 1970s. It narrowed through the 80s and 90s, and it has remained fairly flat since 2000. So using the most recent data, Women who work full-time year-round earn 78.6 cents for every dollar a man earns. If the pace of change continues as, at the same rate as it has since 1960, it will take another 45 years, or until 2059, 
for men and women in the United States to reach parity. We project that Florida will be the first state to close the wage gap in 2038, and Wyoming will be the last in 2159, over 140 years from now. If all working women aged 18 and older in the U.S. were paid the same as comparable men, and by comparable we mean men who are of the same age, education, urban rural status, and who work the same number of hours, the average woman's earnings would increase by over $6,500 a year, or 17.5%, which I think would be a pretty nice raise. So added up across all working women, that comes to $482.2 billion. To put it another way, U.S. women lost $482 billion due to the wage gap. But we can't ignore the fact that we've been talking about wages for all women overall. The wage gap is even larger for many women of color. When we compare the earnings of women of color to the earnings of white men, who are the largest group in the labor force, we see that Hispanic women earn $24,000 less per year than white men, and black women earn $18,000 less per year than white men. <clears throat> so Hispanic women's earnings are well below the earnings for all women and significantly below the earnings for white men. Uh, these groups have also been found to experience higher rates of sexual assault and intimate partner violence than white survivors, uh, and they face additional barriers to accessing services or the justice system. Um, and these lower earnings make escaping abuse even harder for that reason. So now let's shift to look at women's poverty, which has been on the rise until we heard last week, actually, that it has um, declined a bit in 2015, which is excellent news. But nationally, almost 16% of women over the age of 18 live in poverty, and women are 30% more likely than men to live in poverty. As you can see from the map, Poverty is concentrated largely in the South, so Mississippi has the highest poverty rate for women, about one in four women are in poverty, and Alaska has the lowest poverty rate, fewer than one in 10. It's also worth mentioning that some of the states with the highest earnings for women also have high poverty rates for women. So DC is the most striking example. While DC women have the highest earnings, they also have a high poverty rate. And California has high earnings, but a fairly high rate of women in poverty also. Nebraska is the opposite case. The so women's earnings rank in the bottom 10, yet their poverty rate is relatively low. And just like earnings, poverty rates vary tremendously by race and ethnicity. So Native American and black women are twice as likely to be in poverty as white women, and more than one in four Native American and black women live in poverty. Poverty also varies by household type. The surprising thing we discovered is what would happen to poverty rates if we eliminated the wage gap. So in the graph, the black bars show poverty rates for working women in different family types. And the green bars show what poverty would be for those groups if women earned the same as comparable men. So the poverty rate for working single mothers would be nearly cut in half from 29% to 15%. And the poverty rate for other single women would be more than cut in half, dropping from 11% to 5%. Louisiana, the state with the highest poverty rate among single mothers in the nation at 43.5%, if those women earned the same as comparable men, their poverty rates would fall by 61.3%. So as you've noticed, I keep coming back to the wage gap. Maybe you're already pretty familiar with the data about the wage gap, but some new analysis IWPR has done has really driven home for me why the wage gap is so important. These days, a large majority of mothers are in the labor force. Not only have we moved away from the days of stay-at-home wives, we're also moving away from stay-at-home mothers, probably in large part because workers' real earnings have been declining for decades. In other words, women's wages are not optional, and they have real impact on women and their families. In the U.S. today, Half of all households with children under 18 have a breadwinner mother who is either a single mother or a married mother who earns at least 40% of the couple's earnings. And we just recently released a quick figure looking at breadwinner mothers by race, ethnicity, and state. In half of households with white or Hispanic mothers, that mother is a breadwinner. For Native American moms, that goes up to about two in three. 
but a striking four out of five black mothers are breadwinners, and the vast majority of them are single mothers. So not only do women's earnings matter, but policies that support working families also matter. And I don't want to shock anyone, but the news on this is not good. Out of the 50 states in D.C., only 14 have passed any state or local paid leave law, including temporary disability insurance, which provides four to six weeks of paid maternity leave, paid family and medical leave, and paid sick days. California is the only state with all of those. Everyone is likely to need time away from work, whether it's due to their own illness or to care for themselves, a child, or another family member. Since women are the majority of those who provide unpaid caregiving, having access to job-protected paid leave, including maternity leave, is especially important for them to stay in the workforce and to advance. And while nine in 10 high-income workers have access to paid sick time as a benefit, only one in five low-income workers do. So many women who need to take care of themselves or a family member struggle to balance that care with work obligations and cannot afford to lose income if they miss work. In addition to uh, specifically bring this back to survivors, uh, survivors are estimated to miss seven to 10 days of paid work a year. Uh, so access to paid leave is particularly important for them uh, who need to take off time to heal from violence, uh, seek services, or participate in the justice system. Uh, especially considering that only around a third of states have laws in place providing paid or unpaid leave specifically for survivors, um, and many survivors fear discrimination or retaliation from their, uh, from their employer, some of these broader policies may be very beneficial to them. So we consider all the women who are providing care for a child, a parent, or an adult with a disability we can see that one in three women workers have kids under 18, a third of families with kids have a single parent, one in seven lives with an adult with a disability. Every day, 10,000 baby boomers turn 65, and that is expected to continue until 2030. And the number of men and women over the age of 50 who are caring for someone over 65 has tripled in the past 15 years. The final topic I want to touch on today that impacts the economic security of women is violence and harassment in the workplace. As you all know, intimate partner violence can have a profound effect on women's employment. One study estimated that women lose almost 8 million days of paid work annually due to intimate partner violence, and many report struggling to concentrate at work and fear of getting fired due to their performance or missed time. But sexual harassment in the workplace also threatens women's safety, well-being, and opportunities to advance, and is widespread. More than one in four women and one in 10 men have experienced it. And yet, like other types of violence, it often goes unreported. So thank you so much, Julie, for that wonderful information. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Asha to uh, explore the website and, and inform you how to access the data for yourself. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Asha Dumontier, and I'm going to take you on a tour of IWPR's Status of Women in the States interactive website, which is a great resource for getting data points, reading highlights from different chapters of the reports, and downloading additional data. So as you can see on the home page, there's a map of the country. And as you hover your mouse above different states, you can see how they rank and their overall grade for employment and earnings. If you want to see how states rank in a different area, you just need to click that chapter's name in the sidebar on the right hand of the screen. Let's say you want to learn more about work and family. You can just click on the tab and then can see how the states rank on the work and family index. As you can see, we can find out that Washington State ranks 14th in the country on IWPR's Work and Family Index, with an overall grade of C+. Now, let's say you were from Washington State and wanted to find out more information about Washington in general. You can click on the state, which takes you to a page with key stats in the state and a report card summary that shows the state's grades for each chapter of the report.
Here you can see how Washington is doing under each category. On this page you can also download the state fact sheet to get a PDF with key findings and highlights in the state. So that link is right here. You can also scroll down to access more state level data under each chapter. So for example, we can see that 32.4% of women in Washington state had a bachelor's degree or higher in 2013. If you'd like to read content from a specific chapter of the report, you can click on the Explore the Data tab at the top of the screen, and then click Data by Topic. Let's say you wanted to learn more about political participation. You would click on that chapter, which takes you to the Political Participation page. If you scroll down below the map, you can find topics within the Political Participation chapter. Let's say that you wanted to learn more about voter turnout. You can click on that link to read a paragraph about voter turnout. You can also click See the Data for more quick stats on the subject. So now we know that 67% of women were registered to vote in 2012. If we want to go back to the home screen, we just exit out of this window, scroll to the top of the page, and click on IWPR's Status of Women in the States logo in the top right-hand corner. Or that's the left-hand corner, I'm sorry. In addition to finding data by state and topic, you can search for information by population group. Let's say that you wanted data on women of color specifically. If you click on Explore the Data once again, at the top of the page you can choose Data by Population Groups. Here you can see a list of different population groups that you might want to learn more about. So for now we'll click on Women of Color. Here you can read about how women of color in the United States are faring for each chapter in the Status of Women in the States report. For example, if you click on Poverty and Opportunity, you can read about different topics in the Poverty and Opportunity chapter. Here in this first paragraph, we can read about how women's health insurance coverage rates vary by race and ethnicity. So now, for all the researchers out there, I'd also like you to show, to show you how you can download the data files we compiled for the 2015 SAS Women in the States National Report. If you scroll to the top of the page and again click on Explore the Data, you can choose to download the 2015 data. Here you'll be taken to a page where you can download Excel files for each of the seven chapters. So you just click on one of these links and you could download the Excel file directly. Another way you can use the Status of Women in the States website is to find recent reports and publications that are part of the series and available for download. If you scroll up to the top of the page and hover your mouse over the Publications tab, you can see links to different reports and fact sheets. For example, you can click on the Stats of Women in the South tab to find PDF links to the report IWPR published in April of this year, focusing on women of color in the South. Here you can down an executive, download an, ex, an executive summary, the report in full, or download specific chapters of the report. Finally, while there's many other fun things you can do on our website, the last item I'll show you for now is how to sign up to hear more about the Status of Women in the States project and to get notifications when new publications are released. If you look again at the top of the page and click on the About tab, you can click on Join. On this page, you can enter your email address to be added to our mailing list. That way, you can hear right away when we have updates on our data or have additional resources to share. So that's all I have for now, but please feel free to email with any questions or comments you may have. I'd also urge you to all play around with the website a little bit more. There are many gems and great data points to find just by exploring the different chapters and state tabs. So thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Asha. Okay, so we have a question real quick. Um, Carolyn would like to know, are there stats for women living alone, either never married, divorced, or widowed? For the most part, we simply have demographics by state, so we have um, marital status, those who are 
separated, divorced, never married at, in a demographic section that's available on the website or in the published reports. At the state level, we don't often break it down by those statuses because it just gets sort of too small. So in many cases, we can't combine enough data to report for the majority of states. Let's see. So at this point, I would encourage uh, anybody else who has a question to please type it into the chat box here, and we would love to address them. Um, while, while you uh, think of those or type those in, I would uh, direct you to the slide here, which has each of our email addresses on it, as well as the, um, the website for IWPR and the status of women. Um, in addition, I wanted to mention that there's a number of resources that were talked about today. Um, that are accessible for free download online, including a number of quick figures that, um, that Julie mentioned, a number of resources on the wage gap. And then um, also Julie mentioned the, um, the basic economic security tables, which is a resource that was developed by Wider Opportunities for Women and, and is now part of IWPR. Um, and in that project, uh, we calculate what the actual very basic costs are um, for states and also down to the county level. So um, we provide those uh, for up to 420 different family types, including one or two parents um, and um, up to six different children of different ages. So the numbers get very, very specific. Um, so that is available at basiceconomicsecurity.org and um, you can actually look up um, any of your jurisdictions, you can compare across, across jurisdictions and then across family types as well. Um, so we encourage you to use that, resources, that resource as well for, um, for any advocacy uh, you might want to do as well as any case management with survivors or any other populations that you're trying to help get on a path to economic security. Um, and then there's also a number of economic security for survivors projects, uh, project products, um, including our population policy brief series, which goes into depth exploring the intersections of economics and safety for, um, populate, for different underserved populations, including uh, women of color, uh, survivors with um, with disabilities, LGBTQ, Native survivors, um, et cetera. So all those resources are available for free online. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, the Economic Security for Survivors Project is a technical assistance and training provider. So if anybody is interested in discussing these ideas further and how you can use them to help the survivors you work with, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, and now let me see what other kind of questions have been rolling in. So it looks like, uh, okay, so for government agencies, what are some suggested ways to observe Domestic Violence Awareness Month? Um, great question. We're all very excited about um, DVAM that's coming up in October for anybody who wasn't aware. Um, it's a great opportunity to increase conversations with, uh, with your partner agencies, with, your, um, with the programs that you fund or work with, and with the communities that you serve in general. Um, obviously, we come at this from an economic perspective, and we think that that is a lens that is highly um, under-discussed um, and yet so critical. So uh, we encourage you to share any of the resources that, um, that you might find interesting, either um, from this presentation or on the website. And then there's also a number of resources on the Domestic Violence Awareness Month website. I, I think it's dbam.com, <laughs> um, but I can look that up and send it out to everybody in a follow-up email when we send out the presentation. Um, but there's a lot of social media tools, um, events that are posted that are happening around the country based on this um, that, that I encourage you to get involved in. It's a great opportunity for everyone to come together and share information. All right, uh, and if everybody, anybody else has any suggestions based, um, based on what they can do, please add it in the chat. I think this should be a great collaborative conversation. All right. 
how does the website, or hi, does the website offer data on immigrant migrant workers? Um, yes, yeah, so the website does have a section, um, it's a spotlight on immigrant women specifically. Um, so if you go to the um, explore the data tab and then look at data by population groups, you can click on immigrant women. And in that section we have information on the employment and earnings of immigrant women. Um, so that includes workers. Uh, we don't have any original data analysis on migrant workers in particular, but that, can, uh, that area of the website could still probably be a great resource for you. All right, is there any information on girls under 18? Um, if not, are there any resources that you would suggest? Yes, we did include some information on in the violence and safety section based on the youth behavioral risk survey. And we focused there on some uh, indicators of girls sort of school attendance related to um, concern for their safety either on the way to or at school. And um, there are some interesting results and variations by state in that. And then um, we also looked at uh, dating violence uh, sexual dating violence, physical dating violence, and bullying of various types. So um, I can't probably off the top of my head list some other resources, and, but if you look up the Youth Behavior Risk Survey, that may be a really uh, useful resource and maybe that would be a good way to come across publications that speak to the issue of um, girls and violence. Uh, and if you're looking for um, violence specifically as it relates to uh, to younger girls, then um, the the population policy brief series I mentioned that the S project has includes a brief on uh, youth survivors. Um, in addition to that resource, I would direct you to Futures Without Violence. They have a great uh, wealth of resources on um, on violence for younger people, um, as well as loveisrespect.org. They have a lot on teen dating violence. Um, so those are the first two that came into my head, but I, I can include more resources in our follow-up if, if they come to me. <laughs> All right, let's see, what else? Okay, Susan has a couple questions. Uh, why have only data from government findings been used? Is it fully representative? Uh, or do you all think there are women who are not represented by the data? Data from government sources has been used because IWPR developed these composites, a way to grade states, and we need sources that are going to be consistent in the way they collect and report data year for year. So some, in some cases, um, maybe reproductive rights, we rely on another nonprofit that has been sort of publishing and updating annually. But in many cases, if we just were to rely on, say, um, like a journal article that reported for states one year, we wouldn't be able to track trends over time. So it's important to us both that we can get data for all the states that things are collected in a consistent way over time because trends are really um, sort of the most revealing, to just tell you a number today is not so much um, answering economic questions as is that improving or getting worse. So that's really the reason that it's primarily government sources. And I noticed the question above about immigrant migrant workers. There definitely are populations that cannot be represented simply because um, the numbers are too small to report at a state level. It might be possible to do at a national level, but there are just issues, of course, in sort of under-reporting concerns that people would have. The same thing with violence, where we uh, aren't able to sort of report as robustly as we'd like due to sort of under-reporting discrepancies in the ways data are collected. So there are all these sort of wonky factors, but I'm sure there are groups that we, we can't speak about that we know are important populations of women, but are still always looking for that sort of consistent source. Uh, do you have uh, disaggregated data for API communities? Yes. And also Latina, Latino communities? Yes, absolutely. There are a, a few states where we can't report for Asian Pacific Islander women, but for the most part, um, Anything we can is disaggregated by race and ethnicity, and we do break out separately um, Hispanic women and Asian Pacific Island women. Okay. Do you have any research on why non-DV agencies are allowed to record data on HMIS? 
and I do not. <laughs> and I, um, I don't actually know what HMIS does. Sorry, is. I'm not familiar with that. Um, so uh, Eva or Eva, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but if you would like to um, elaborate on that question a little bit, then we can come back to that if we are able to. But um, my initial inkling is, no, we don't have any research on that. <laughs> All right, Susan, um, do you think that Caucasian women are less likely to report abuse due to social stigma? And I, I would say that's an interesting question. I don't know how much more the social stigma would be for that population than others. Uh, we know that there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot less reporting, say, for um, certain immigrant communities because of um, because of various uh, social stigmas and pressures as well as um, you know certain uh, religious factors that come into play and a lot of the times those communities tend to be very um, small and close knit so there's there can be a, a lot of ostracization that takes place when you report violence um, but I'm not sure how much the stigma from, uh, for reporting um, is necessarily tied to race specifically. Um, I think it's, there's definitely still stigma everywhere across the country for everyone. Um, and it's, you know, it's something that we're, we're working on building awareness of and, and reaching out to these communities who might be less likely to report to um, overcome some of those barriers to reporting. Um, so I, I uh, hope that somewhat answer the question. And again, if anybody wants to chime in on any of these discussion points, please feel free to do so in the chat. Um, so uh, going back to somewhat tied to the immigrant question, do we have any data on uh, Muslim women specifically? We do not. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think, um, it's an interesting question actually. I just have not um, looked at or for data that is disaggregated by that factor, and I don't know if it exists, but um, in any case, I haven't seen any reporting from IWPR about that, but it uh, definitely would be interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, will this be updated every few years? Yes, hopefully. So um, it's our intention and hope to, we, we keep up at the national level. As you can probably imagine, it, it was a massive undertaking to update every state, every indicator, produce a website, and so on. So that uh, we don't know when we're going to do next, but we are always looking for funding opportunities because we would like to keep that up. You know, we, the website, we're hoping to uh, update at least every other year so that the data is fresh and that this is a sort of up-to-date uh, resource. Do you think it might be a good idea to also list Caucasian women in the women of color category as well? Uh, they are. So when you look at the tables, it, it always compares. Um, it has the major um, racial and ethnic groups in the country. So I believe we have white women, black African-American women, Hispanic, Asian Pacific Islander, uh, Native American, and women of two races yeah. or other. Right. So yes, they're, they're included in all the tables as a, as a reference group. So women overall, white women, and then all those groups we just listed. Great. Um, Samantha, I'm so glad you enjoyed the PowerPoint. Uh, we will be sending out the PowerPoint uh, as a whole as, as slides. We will also be sending out a recording of, the, of this whole session. Um, and then there will also be links to a lot of the resources we talked about. We don't necessarily have one condensed infographic handout that kind of summarizes all of this, but um, it would be great if <laughs> that's a great idea to develop. I will keep that in mind. Thank you. <laughs> all right, Lori. So the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services hosts ribbon-making events. Oh, good. So this is for DV Awareness Month. Um, wonderful. Yeah, the, um, there's some great stuff happening in Pennsylvania. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and I would imagine there's uh, probably similar events going on in a lot of the states if, if you look up. Um, I'm sure that it's, it's all listed in various, various places on the Internet. Okay. 
Oh, great. Um, oh, it's good to see you, Shana. Um, so uh, anybody who has questions about HMIS can contact Shana Goodman, uh, who's with the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, and um, she's a great partner and a great resource, so, so I encourage you to contact her. Oh, homeless management. Oh, great. Yeah, so, um, so yes, yeah, that's actually great to bring up. The, there, is, there are huge connections between homelessness and domestic violence, uh, especially for women. Um, and it's, you know, it's a big problem for um, women with children as well. So uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for, one, collecting data within both domestic violence and um, homelessness programs, um, as well as, you know, Cross, cross training, sharing of resources, um, all of that. So that's great. I'm so glad you brought that up. Okay, so uh, Samantha brought up, how is it tied to legal consequences to the batterer? Um, so I, I'm not sure if I completely understand uh, the, the question in terms of um, what is tied, but um, I will, you know, talk for a little bit and see if I'm touching on uh, what you're getting at here. And if not, please let me know. Um, so in terms of legal consequences to the batterer and how that intersects with, uh, with economic security, there are obviously a number of ways um, the, the offender, especially if we're talking about domestic violence, where there's a number of, um, there's a lot more dependency on, on an abuser for, um, for economic resources, uh, where they control the resources, uh, where it's a lot harder for a survivor to escape. Um, so in light of all of that, it's, there's a lot of times where um, if an abuser is um, incarcerated or, um, or you know, has, loses his job for, um, because of the, any sort of legal action, then that can have economic consequences for the survivor, and that is something that they often have to take into account when, um, you know, making decisions to report or to participate in a um, in the criminal justice system or a civil justice system, um, and uh, and it also can impact the um, also the legal remedies available for survivors. So there are a number of economic remedies within both the civil and criminal justice system that can help uh, restore survivors economically for the cause and consequences of violence, ranging from um, you know, housing provisions or um, other economic remedies in civil protection orders to ordering restitution in criminal cases for the economic cost that the offender's action has caused. Um, so those are just a couple of the uh, of the intersections between um, the legal system, uh, the batterer, and the and victims' economic security. And I'm not sure if any of that answered answered your question, but I'm happy to talk to you more um, if you would like to get in touch with me. Okay, so DV shelters are not required to. Uh, to record data on the um, this government database and on okay great yeah so I think um, Shana included her email above but it's s goodman at nrcdv.org okay. Great, thanks Susan for that input. All right, so does anybody else else have any other questions before we let you get back to your day here? All right, so once again, uh, we will be sending out the resources, uh, the recording, and, um, and any links that we may have discussed and promised here today. Um, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to uh, listen to us today and have this discussion with us. Uh, we hope that you find this information valuable and that you will be able to use it going forward within your work. Um, 
And um, if you have any questions, please contact us. If you would like any guidance on how to use this or where to find any information, please contact us. We are here as resources. And lastly, I want to thank Julie and Asha very much for their, for their time, for their input, and for their excellent information. Thank you. All right, everybody have a wonderful day. Goodbye.